We are live. Okay. I will stop eating seaweed. <laughs> like, don't stop forever. No, just for no, just for the, I now have little bits. Do you eat, like, roasted seaweed at all? I have. Yeah, they have like these these pack. It's just like so much packaging. So they have them at Costco where they're like oh, a, yeah. you know, it's like a big, kind of almost like a, um, a bale, and then inside there are these foil packages, and that each one has package. like a little plastic case. I just like I can't. So, uh, so this is what those are before you slice them up and put them in plastic, and it is one container filled with like. 10 sheets that are the size of this package. It is. But isn't that just for making sushi? No, this is munchable. This is the exact same stuff. Okay, so it's it's roasted with salt. Yeah, it's the exact right. same stuff that goes in those tasty little containers of garbage. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, they bring me great joy, but then leave little tiny pieces of sea seaweed, like a trail yeah. behind me everywhere I yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Um, Luckily, Eddie likes seaweed. So yeah, so I have I have a bunch of them, but unsalted for making sushi with. Yeah, yeah, it's we usually do, but ours are all used up. Why? Okay, so who's got the bad internet? Is it you? Is it me? It's me. Okay. And someone just got here to drop off groceries, which means there's going to be a dog explosion. I don't hear anything yet. Yeah, I see the car because I'm in the basement, and the dogs oh, have not okay. yet seen the car. Right. So be prepared. Yeah. Um, Got a rant prepared? We can do it early. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do I have a rant? What was I ranting about recently? Um, American born, born Chinese. Have you seen this show on Disney? Not, yeah, it's supposed to be really good is what I read. It's really I good. It. Okay. Yeah, it's so good. So it's it's based on a graphic novel mm -hmm. um, that won, it was like the first graphic novel to ever win a literary prize. Oh, wow. Um, it was the winner, it was a National Book Award finalist, the winner of the Prince Award. Um, and it's really good. Yeah. And so if you like see it and you're like, oh, that like, is that some um, dumb uh, teen comedy from Disney? No, no, absolutely not. It is a um, very deep and moving exploration of what it's like to be uh, minority Chinese in California, right? Like in the U.S., yeah. And also what it's like to be the uh, the son of the Monkey King uh, who is uh, chasing you to recover the staff of destiny while being protected by the, uh, a Buddhist um, god okay. so or I, uh, spirit. I feel like this is going to be one of my next things that I binge watch. Yeah. Uh, is that been once a once a gardening anecdote? No problem. I built the, the king of all <laughs> compost piles. So, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tell I've got this. Well, I, I'm, uh, like, I'm just like, like everybody, you're chronically out of compost if you, if you garden. And so, yeah. um, I was at Starbucks and I was like, do you guys have any beans? Any, you know, the, of the, the espresso beans? beans? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they give them off, give them away when they're, when they're done with them. Yeah. And they're like, well, we have a garbage can out back. It's just for that. So go ahead, just grab whatever you want. So you go in there and there's like hundred pounds of, of espresso grounds in the in this garbage each week that is so glorious yeah yeah so just like i'm just like okay great and so I just like i fill the back of my car with espresso grounds and then i add them to the all of the other compost stuff that i've got and so now i've got a, a compost pile that is like five feet across five feet high uh it's gonna get very hot yeah and I've, i feel like i've cracked this this issue i've cracked now so now i have hopefully as I sort of get ahead of this year on year on year, I will have as much compost as I can, as I can stand. So that's... that is my, yeah, that's my, <laughs> and then I don't, did I mention last week that I gave my dad a bunch of firewood. No, no. So I, so I took my dad a bunch of firewood. Like my dad is, you know, my dad is slowing down his ability. He used to just cut down a couple of trees every year on his property and mm -hmm. turn them into firewood. And, 
so I've got mountains and mountains of, of little trees. There's the dog explosion. Yeah, as expected. I knew it was yeah. coming. Yeah, I've got mountains of trees, and so I said, "Well, I'll, I'll deliver you firewood." And so I filled up this this cargo trailer that I have with firewood, and it holds about a quart of wood. So it's like a okay, lot so of wood. What are you towing with? This is what I care about. With the SUV. Okay. Yeah, the, the SUV can pull five thousand pounds. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, yeah. I for people who want to buy a truck, buy an SUV or a car, and then get a trailer. I, yeah. I highly recommend. Like the trailer holds. Like my trailer will hold three times as much as the back of a pickup truck. Yeah. So I was looking at a CRV because like we currently have a little itty bitty tiny three door Kia. It's towing nothing. No. Um, yeah. But I, I was looking at the CRV and they just don't tow enough weight. They, yeah. And, and so the trailers I was looking at, it's just like I could not put 10 bales of hay on that. It would outweigh yeah. what can be towed. So. Yeah, so I would pull, I would get like whatever is the minimum to pull what the weight that you require. Yeah. And so we've got like a Ford Explorer with a with a V6 and it can pull yeah. 5,500 pounds. So it can't chassis. pull quite as much as a pickup truck can, right. but it can do pretty well. But it, you, there's, you know, it's probably surprising used cars in the last 10 years that you look at and you're like, well, that's a nice car. Yeah like a Honda Pilot or something, and it could pull, you know, because that's like the next level up. You know, and I'm not sure how much you want to pull, but if you want to pull 2,000 pounds, yeah. 3,000 pounds, like my old Volvo could pull 2,500 pounds. Yeah, 2, I'd, like, yeah. I'd like at least 3,000 pounds because a reason, so it, just like with anything else, to get it lightweight costs more. So to get a reasonably priced trailer big enough to put a sheet of plywood on it without cutting the plywood, you're looking at 1,500 pounds or a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you're starting at 1,500 pounds and you want to then pile shit on top of that. Yep. I'd like. Yeah, and that's what mine is. Mine yeah. is like pretty, mine is a pretty well built, like a quad trailer. Mm -hmm. And it's about 1,500 pounds, and yeah. then we built plywood walls for it. Yes. And so, it, and so it's 10 feet by 5 feet by 2 feet. And so then I, you know, when I fill it with logs or wood chips or compost or whatever, the, the truck can pull that. Yeah. And so that's, that makes me happy. Yeah. And it's just, it's so versatile. So, yeah. yeah, if you're like, oh, I you know, I have, I'd really like to be able to do stuff that carries cargo i really need a pickup truck you don't no yet get a trailer get a tow package and trailer and then with it with a trailer then you can do things like put on a bike rack and then you can take yes. bikes on the back yeah. so what are we going to do about your internet here because it's pretty pretty bad it's really terrible i don't know what to do this has been affecting our entire house i was hoping it would be good enough to do this show uh mm. we've been having flooding so the best I can say is, do you want to try and record tomorrow and I'll go over no, to your friend's no, house? No, 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 no. Okay, Absolutely then not. I'm just no. not going to move. Yeah, that's exactly. You minimize the bandwidth by not moving. Yeah. Um, hold on, let me But also yeah, it's fine. I don't see people complaining. Maybe it's, maybe the, the version that I'm getting is worse than the version that the that the internet is seeing. No, because I'm, I'm seeing my video stopping periodically. I'm going to... Okay. Also make sure that anything that might be open in the background is closed um, in case any of it is. So we ran into the weirdest internet issue on top of everything else. The DNS for Chrome is having problems, but the DNS for everything else seems to be fine. And I'm not sure why only Chrome would have DNS Because Google has its own DNS server. Is that what's going on? And it on? defaults it to, and it's like 1.1.1.1, oh, no. I think. Yeah, and so, and so okay. you can, in Chrome, change its DNS server. Okay. But, <clears throat> or you can use Google's DNS server for everything that you do if you want. But I do not recommend that. No, currently it is not working. I I yeah. switched to using Safari on a Windows machine. That was the sad state I was in. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's the uh, that's the reality. All right. Yeah, people saying a few frame drops, but but it's fine. Okay. So so yeah. I'm going to get my microphone so it stops trying to fall over. I have succeeded. 
I am going to press that record button and I'm going to press that record button and we are recording. Cast, episode 687, Prepping for the Moon. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. McKay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I am doing well, and I have to say, I am so pleased that your pursuit of Chinese over the past five some odd years is seriously going to pay off today because <laughs> you understand all well you don't understand all the chinese language stuff but you've no. been tracking the chinese space yes. industry a whole lot yes. closer than i have hand yep. in hand with learning the language and that is going to be awesome because i can sit back and learn today yeah how duh all right <laughs> let's uh, jio let's go um so we're going back to the moon in the next few years humans will set foot on the moon again ideally this time to stay but this will be different than the apollo era going to the scientifically fascinating and difficult southern pole of the moon what needs to be done to prepare the way back to the moon and we will talk about it in a second but it's time for a break and we're back so what is the plan i mean to return to the moon if er if all goes well what's going to happen if all goes well, there is going to be a space station, uh, the NASA Gateway, that is positioned between here and the moon that essentially acts like the spaceship version of a train station, allowing people to fly safely from Earth to the Gateway on Starship, on Orion, all of the plans they show, show Orion, and then once there, uh, get rested up and then ferry back and forth from the moon. The next step is there are plans that are still a little bit fuzzier, not as many contracts have been made, to create a habitat on the moon where folks will be able to live, rove, explore, and stay in contact with Earth thanks to a network of satellites. Right. And I guess, what does the South Pole of the Moon, what makes this more logistically challenging than going to the places they landed during the Apollo missions? So there, there's basically three big problems. I'm going to start with the least intuitive, and that is the orbital plane. When you look at the moon, it is not that tilted relative to the Earth. It's tilted about a degree and a half relative to the uh, Earth's orbital plane. And getting from here to there, it's super easy to put yourself in an orbit that has plus or minus 20 degrees uh, inclination. But the South Pole is not plus or minus 20 degrees. So you have to get yourself there and also rotate your orbit so that you're going over the poles and hmm. then figure out how to land in this extremely dynamic terrain where there are craters miles deep and areas of permanent shadow and permanent sunlight, which each require their own environmental dealings. And it's just a challenge to get yourself into the right orbit and then figure out how to land there. And I mean, when you go into polar orbit, like the polar orbit has a really big advantage, which mm -hmm. is, is that it lets you reach every single part of the planet. Yeah. You just have to wait for it to rotate underneath you. And so you can launch into a polar orbit here on Earth from almost anywhere, yeah. you just head for the pole, and and then now you're going, you know, you're passing across the pole, then you're passing across the south pole. You know, there may be some minor changes to your orbit that you're going to have to pull off, depending on how accurate you want it to be. But to go to the moon, right, you've got to go on this orbit that follows the Earth's equator first to get out yeah. to the moon, and then you've got to switch to a polar orbit at the moon, and that is tricky. It's not just tricky, it's energy intensive. And we do everything we can to uh, 
reduce the amount of fuel that is needed. And there are low fuel ways to get there if you go into these massive orbits. But if you're carrying humans, that then is going to require more water, more air, more consumables. And so now you need more fuel because you're carrying more stuff. <coughs> and I'm going to have a random coughing fit. Um, and, and so pick how you want this to be expensive. No matter what you do, it's going to be an expensive orbit to get into. Yeah. All right. So that's the first problem, the orbit. What's next? So once you are there, you you have to figure out okay so the permanently shadowed areas are where there's most likely water the permanently sunny areas are where you have constant communications with earth where you uh have solar energy from here to forever and you need to figure out where you're going to put yourself balanced between these two useful parts of the environment and not have a difficult time getting between the two. And right. And so like, like when you go during the Apollo era, they would just land and yeah. be on the moon for a few hours or a few days during the lunar day. So they had sunlight the entire time. They had consistent warmth temperature. They knew what they were planning for. They could see Earth, communicate with Earth. But if you're going to be on the moon for any period of time, you've got to go through a lunar day and a lunar night, right. both of which are 28 days long, which is no. a long time both to handle either long. of those conditions. Hmm? Both which is 14 days long. It's 20 right. the whole cycle. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Both of which are 14 days long. So it's tricky to handle that length of a time. You've got to be able to have a heating system that can keep you powered up during the long lunar night. And you need to have a cooling system that can keep you alive during the long lunar day. Both yeah. are tricky. And, and then it's just the whole getting all the resources you need and not getting dust inside your spacecraft. And this is one of the things that I think I've taken the greatest personal amusement in watching them try and figure out. Because here on Earth, our dust is a combination of things that are fairly soft and fluffy to begin with, like flakes of skin, and things that have been buffeted by air, wind, water, and these processes soften the edges. Dust on the moon is basically little tiny itty bitty shards of glass. And mm. that is less pleasant. So they need to figure out how to keep the dust on the outside and be able to get inside and outside to do regular maintenance, to go hopefully mine water. And, and so they need to solve a double problem, which is how do you get in and out of your habitat where you're going to live? And then how do you travel around the moon potentially overnight and not subject yourself to dust? And so they're actually considering some of these fabulous looking rovers where your spacesuits attach to the outside yeah. and you slide into them and they just look ridiculous. That's, that's really the only thing I can say. And I think the other issue is the the lack of communication. So if you're yeah. at the far side of the moon near the South Pole, then you won't have a direct line of sight mm -hmm. back to Earth. And so all communications will have to go through some relay station at the moon to then get your communications back to Earth, which just makes things a more more challenging again. But it's a solvable problem. We solved it for our own planet. And... Lockheed has been contracted by NASA to solve it for the moon, and it just means more satellites, smaller ones in this case, orbiting mm -hmm. our smaller neighbor. And the, and the Chinese have done this. They had a yes. lunar relay uh, during one of their previous missions, and they were able to send data back and forth from Earth, from the lander, even though it was the far side of the moon. There was no direct line of sight. So, all right, we're going to talk about how some of these problems are going to be addressed in a second, but it is time for another break. And we're back. So based on this, we know that humans are going to be going and going to try and work on the moon and 
do more science and maybe last longer. What <laughs> what plans are in the works now? What missions are going to fly to start to prepare the ground for their arrival? So the the ones that I've seen most in the process of actually getting completed are actually the ones that are going to prepare the space. So we have Northrop Grumman and uh, Maxar working together on the Lunar Gateway where Maxar is working on the uh, engine and electricity system. We have Northrop Grumman looking on the, working on the crew cabins. And this is the start of what will be the next large hopefully permanently occupied space station that will come after the International Space Station. Uh, we only know there's so many years we can get out of that low Earth orbit giant system and its days yeah. are numbered. And the yeah. next one we build is going to be a whole lot further out. Which would be crazy. Like, think that there will be people probably, I mean, it won't be permanently inhabited in the beginning, but there right. will be times when you look up at the moon and you're like, I know there is a space station somewhere in that vicinity that has people on board. Yes. They're still there, yep. you know, for, for weeks, maybe uh, months. It'll be great. Um, okay. So, and this is the Lunar Gateway. Now, the first missions aren't going to use the Lunar Gateway. They're going to do a direct route. Direct. They're going to, so, so what else is being prepared to to help with these this exploration and this is where we have a special edition of the starship program by spacex where they are building a refuelable on orbit uh it's the front part not the booster part uh of their starship mission and it's going to act like a ferry boat carrying people back and forth uh, in this case, it will be docking initially, they're saying, with an Orion capsule. Uh, so the idea is the astronauts board an Orion, uh, launch on whatever is launching the Orion at that point in time, get carried out to cislunar space, meet up with the Starship, uh, dock the two vehicles together, move to the Starship, fly the Starship to the moon where it is capable of landing. They do all the things you're going to do, and then the entire thing flies back up and is nominally reusable the same way any other ferry boat is reusable once you refuel it and check the engines to do maintenance. This is bonkers. Like, yeah. have you ever like been on a cruise ship and you're in a port where don't have a, a big port they can't handle the full cruise ships right. so they put you in a tender and yeah. you get in the tender and you go out to the dock and you dock it's that but imagine you cross the ocean in the tender and then it was time to dock at the port you get into the cruise ship and dock at the dock and then back out to your tender and then you continue on with your voyage it, the the scale of starship is just so big and and this is where a lot of folks are really hoping that they sort out just what happened with with Starship. I saw some work over the weekend. Phil Metzger was talking about how the environmental samples they're looking at appear to be more sand than cement. So it's looking like they blasted one part of the dunes to another part of the dunes, which is not environmentally good, but it's a whole lot less worse than blasting cement to Kingdom Come. Um, right. So right. hopefully all of that will get sorted quickly because in an ideal world, you launch in a giant starship, take new fuel, take new supplies, re redo Lunar Gateway however it's needed, transfer on to the other starship that is designed to literally just go back and forth from the moon. And it's it's a really cool future to imagine, but right now it's it's just sort of like taking an elevator to a mobile skyscraper, and it's kind yeah. of silly. And I mean, the way this is supposed to work now is that Starship, you know, SpaceX has won the contract for the human landing system on the moon mm -hmm. and they have to do a test flight yes. they have to prove that they can safely fly down to the surface of the moon and then back up and ideally in time for the 2026 artemis 3 mission that's only three years away I and know. we still haven't even seen the first launch of starship yet 
they're well, going to be did, like it just didn't succeed fine yeah yeah we haven't <laughs> the first successful launch of starship not to mention the first successful orbital refueling not to mention wow. the first lunar version of starship flying not to mention a successful test down to the surface of the moon in preparation yeah. for because the artemis 2 and artemis 3 missions are are from what i can tell on time so let's, let's just they're going to be ready that that Space is hard, timelines yeah. are redonkulous, and yeah. we don't actually know when any of this is going to happen. Yeah. We we stay that we say currently that the next couple of Artemis missions with SLS look like they're on time, but do we really know? Yeah. Um and I mean, as with the I guess with the commercial crew system that gets yeah. astronauts up to the international space station they have the crew dragon and theoretically they have the cst starliner yeah. uh the boeing cst 100 starliner so we're still waiting for that first human test of the right. starliner to actually right. carry people nasa has done the same thing where they're not putting all of their eggs in the spacex basket so they've contracted with blue origin to provide a lander for the 2029 artemis mission so you've got this balance. So SpaceX is going to get a bunch of landings and then theoretically Blue Origin is going to get a couple of landings and hopefully competition will be injected into the system so that you're going to have both attempting to, you know, compete with each other and not just have a monopoly on launch on landing services at the moon. But it's a it's a big risk for NASA to put the actual landing system into the hands of a private company and pay them for the services as opposed to developing developing it in-house sort of in the way they did with with the space launch system so it's I, I think it's important to point out though that NASA has always gotten its uh, bits and pieces from for-profit companies Boeing, yes, Lockheed, contract, Martian, yeah. uh, Martin, Marietta. I feel like they're all one company Air, almost. Airjet Rocketdyne, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so what we're really seeing is it's finally been acknowledged that all these contracts that allow overruns and, oh, you didn't do it, okay, so we're going to have to pay you another 40%. We're going to have to pay you another 10 years. They're going to take a step back and go, no, we're going to do mm -hmm. like American Airlines does, and you're going to deliver us something complete, and we're going to no negotiate the price in front. So mm -hmm. instead of, I mean, they're seeding the R&D. There, there have been R&D grants along the way, but ultimately they're moving to this new way of doing things where they're playing, paying flat fees and companies are going to have to absorb the cost overruns when they don't deliver as promised. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we, we'll move on here in, in a second, but, you know, this idea of just paying by the seat yeah. is interesting and it has worked in the case of, of commercial cargo and commercial crew. We'll see if it works with hopefully Boeing can can deliver. Uh, it's very weird that they pay SpaceX 60 million a seat and they pay Boeing 90 million a seat. Yeah. But 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 they pay, you know, when they fly people across the country, they pay for airline tickets right. when they right they so so to have commercial operators provide some of these services. And in theory, as space exploration itself just matures we will see more and more of the things that in the, in the olden days you would build bespoke. You build your own flight computer. Now you buy them off the shelf and, right. and customize them. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, but it is time for another break. And we're back. All right, so let's talk about some of the, I guess, scientific missions that are going to help us understand the, the, the region. And this is flashlight pause. Richard, sorry, I just realized, ah, I buried that window and do not remember anything other than it's tiny and didn't work initially. Uh, there's a lunar flashlight. Um, yeah. uh, there is the, uh, uh, there's the Korean mission, the Korean Pathfinder, which has a, I can tackle this a, a bit if you okay, want. Okay, let, let's do that. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah, there there are so many cool missions to to try and look at, and I have to admit there's so many that 
I I haven't been able to keep up. <laughs> well, so I just was like counted up the number of future missions to the moon that have been funded. There's 42 according to Wikipedia. Like 42 and everything. Yeah, that are that are funded as well as eight human missions to the moon so far that are funded. So it is going to be busy. So there's, there's a couple of missions that I think are really interesting. One was the capstone mission, and this was launched by NASA. And its purpose was to essentially fly the the same orbit as the Lunar Gateway. And unfortunately, it failed. So uh, they weren't able to get it to to get into its final flight. Now, that doesn't mean that the orbit for the Lunar Gateway is going to be bad. I mean, you know, maybe they'll do this again. But unfortunately, it didn't work for that mission. But the one that's been really interesting so far is on the Korean Danuri mission. And this is a this is a spacecraft that's been built by South Korea, but they were able to NASA put one instrument on board, which is designed to sort of be a low light camera system. And so it's able to look into the eternally shadowed craters at the South Pole of the Moon and reveal the features inside them. So up in this up until this point, you only had the L L reconnaissance orbiter. And now suddenly you've got this low light camera. It's like someone taking away your stock lens on your DSLR and replacing it with like a 1.2 50 millimeter lens and going to now take some pictures in low light and it works really well. And so now you can see just like, like, and there it's illuminated by ambient reflected light from nearby mountaintops and earth shine. That's its illumination. So um, and to kind of take this to the next level, you've got NASA's got the lunar flashlight mission, which is going to be flying. Um, uh, oh, sorry, lunar flashlight that already flew. Yeah. Um, da -da -da -da. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, and the and the and that failed as well. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Just, let's get that. Yeah. 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 Um, but then, kind of coming up, you've got a bunch of commercial landers which are going to be going to the moon so there's one by astrobotic and they're going to be delivering a bunch of of science instruments and potentially micro rovers and various payloads to the surface of the moon uh the chinese have a whole series of missions they've got the Chang'e six seven and eight and so these are going to be increasingly complicated missions, which are going to be doing scientific analysis of the moon's south pole. Uh, the one of the more interesting ones is you get to number eight. They're starting to build infrastructure on the surface of the moon for communication, for scientific relay, potentially for in situ resource utilization. And this is going to be paving the way for the Chinese human exploration of the moon, which is expected to happen before 2030. So if the if NASA doesn't get there by 2026, you know, we could very well see a, another space race as the Chinese get ready f to land their humans on the surface of the moon at the same time that maybe NASA is maybe not Artemis three, but maybe it's four or five. So it's going to be an interesting time. And as I said, you know, I counted up 42 missions coming uh there's a really cool rover out of nasa called viper that's going to be crawling around on the lunar surface so it's just like uh the chinese are building a a new lunar relay, relay station at the far yeah. side of the moon uh the americans and the europeans are collaborating on an entirely new network for being able to communicate they even are coming up with a new time zone for the moon I so yeah yeah so it's kind of amazing so like like here's where it gets crazy right it's like the surface of the moon has a different speed of clock yeah than yeah. you do at the surface of the earth you know you were at the bottom of a gravity well which is different from the people who are orbiting the earth which is different from the people who are at the surface of the moon which is different from the people who are orbiting the moon right. each of these experience different amounts of of time dilation and you and when communication is on the line and and space after it's supposed to land, you have to account for all this time dilation to make this all work. And then a time zone that makes sense for all the parties involved. So again, I was going to say one more time, 42 missions. The, the, the nearest one is just a couple of months away, and it goes out to about 2030. So that's what's funded so far. What? And then another probably 30 missions that are proposed. What, what I'm really loving is seeing how many of these, which by which I mean like three, uh, have their foundations in the Google Lunar X Prize. 
Yes. There there weren't rockets ready for the Google Lunar X Prize teams to test or fly things within the time span of the competition, but we've since then seen Space IL, uh, Hukata R, and now we're looking at Astrobiotics, uh, all getting missions toward the surface. And while no one has succeeded yet, right. it is advancement one crash at a time. And both Space <laughs> IL and Hokuta R have already been talking about trying again. So yeah. we have really broadened engagement with that particular X Prize. We didn't see the same broadening of, of engagement when scaled composites got their badminton birdie into space twice. But yeah, this I mean, is I think really oh, exciting. Yeah. Over this decade, between now and 2030, we are going to see dozens and dozens of spacecraft go to the moon. Yeah. They're going to be testing out all of the technology that, that's going to be used for future exploration of the moon. They're going to be exploring the moon, both into the internal, you know, the permanently shadowed craters, the lunar ice, to retrieve samples, bring them back to Earth. Like, this is just this is not your grandparents lunar exploration time this is totally different there's probably a dozen maybe even 20 countries involved across yeah. all of the different groups that are doing this from south korea to china to russia to i to israel as you say to brazil to japan to the us to canada uk uh european countries like it is just it's a completely different time and it is like i don't know like like, I don't think people appreciate just how much of a tidal wave of exploration is headed to the moon right now. It's it's a super exciting time. And I'm I'm just in awe of how this is advancing communications, robotics, detector technology yeah. to to explore these craters. They're looking to build tethered robots that they drop into caves, they drop into pits and <laughs> And this is going to advance our own explorations of our own planet. And this is truly showing how advancing any one area of exploration can advance all areas of exploration. And I'm super excited to watch it happen. Yeah, I love this idea that that if you walk outside and you watch the International Space Station fly overhead, like you know there are people up there. Yeah. And that people have been there for over 20 years just mm -hmm. permanently flying in space there's always been people in space yeah. for the time that many of the people who are listening to the show have been alive uh -huh. and there will be a time when you will look up at the moon and you will know that there's a station up there and there's astronauts on the moon and they're working to do science and there's astronauts in orbit and it will just be this time when there were always people in space and so they will get, we'll get to a point where where nobody alive has lived during a time when there wasn't continuous human presence in space. And this is how it happens. This is how we become a solar system spanning civilization. So and you're living it. The thing I'm looking forward to, and it's going to take longer because they're going to the South Pole, is being able to look up at the thinnest of thin crescent moons when you can see the rest of the moon and Earth shine and seeing glowing above the Earth. Earth, Earth, seeing glowing brighter than the Earth shine, the settlements of humans. Yeah, that'd be amazing. It's coming. Soon. All right. Well, thank you, Pamela. And thank you, Fraser. And thank you to all of our patrons out there who are able to get this show ad free and allow us to pay our editors to rescue us when we flub things up or <laughs> cough in the middle of saying a sentence. Um, they make us look good and you make it possible. This week, I would like to thank uh, Harold Barterhagen, Scott Cohn, Alex Cohen, Jim Schooler, Kimberly Reich, uh, Scott Bieber, David Gates, uh, Georgie Ivanov, Marco Iarasi, Daniel Loosley, uh, Sabra Locke, Claudia Mastriani, Matthew Hortzman, Tim Garish, Tim McMacken, Justin Proctor, Jeff Wilson, Grigory, uh, Singleton, the big squish squash, Matthias Hayden, Disastrina, uh, Kinsaya Penflienko, Kenneth 
Ryan, Paul D. Disney, Cooper, Don Mundus, Dean McDaniel, Benjamin Mueller, Iran Zegrev, Omar Del Riviera, Michael Regan, Scott Briggs, Ninja Nick, Peter J. Alex Anderson, Matt Rucker, uh, Veronica Cure, Father Prax, Jim McGeehan, Michelle Cullen, uh, MHW1961 Soup, Frodo Tannenbaugh, uh, Mark Stephen Raznak, Philip Grand, and Antasar. Thank you all so very much. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye bye. And then they saved. They sure did. Oh, I forgot to warn people this was the penultimate episode. It's true. It's true. You listening right now, you have been you warned. Know. Have you started needing reading glasses yet? Yes, but I, I haven't gotten them yet. Yeah, I, I hit. I apparently hit the point this week of, oh, shit, I'm not wearing my glasses. OK, I can get through this. Ah, oh, why am I not? That was my internal dialogue reading those names of they're just just right. on the edge of being readable. Should have worn your glasses. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're upstairs. I'm uh, I'm not as bad as you, I think on that front but i am definitely at the point where like if it's a little light or the text is really small mm -hmm. and there's like no sense that i can hold the thing away to for it to resolve and it's just just it's just unintelligible text i i could totally make right, the text I bigger i did not think of that so i have a rant i do have okay. a rant and so this was brought to our attention by kyle hill but i had noticed this as well, which is that there is a deluge of artificial intelligence created nonsense space stuff on YouTube. And in fact, if you go and like, if you just open up a, like open up an incog mini window, yeah. go to YouTube, let's see if I can see it. Um, and Kyle Hill is a magic player and also sometimes referred to as Science Thor. Science Thor. He plays magic? I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, he's, he's uh, quite often on like uh, Tolarian Community College and some of the other magic channels. How interesting. So, and so like there's, it says like JWST, new discoveries from JWST, and then there's like this picture of space and then there's this little sort of blob and there's an arrow that says god question oh, mark and and they're written by artificial intelligence they are what's scary is that they're they're acceptable science terminology but they are like without a plot <laughs> without a point and they're long they're like an hour long where someone yeah. is just like Astronomers are studying the early universe with the James Webb Space Telescope and looking back to the beginning of time and finding things that they had not anticipated. And that leads us to black holes, which are the most wondrous things in the universe, which are formed at the middle of galaxies. It can also form from stars collapsing, blah, 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 right? Just goes on and on yeah, and on yeah, yeah. for an hour of this just of just verbal space. And they all have reasonable. Ads. Well, of course, ads every 10 minutes and they all reference Michio Kaku or Neil deGrasse Tyson or, um, and this is existential uh -huh. for YouTube, I think, because like the, the one that, that I keep running across has like 6.5 million views. You look at the comments and people are, people are just like talking about it. Um, yeah, they have computer generated voices, but the, yeah. but the voices are like at this point, computer generated voices are perfect yeah like you you could we could do a podcast of astronomy cast with the two of us and nobody would know mm -hmm. that it wasn't us it's really by, kind of disturbing yeah with artificial intelligence with, with training on all of our audio data yeah. so it's it's kind of astonishing um they have huge followings you know millions and millions of of you know i'm sure they're they've got bots that are artificially inflating this as well but they have millions of views they're popping up non-stop and they are really hard to debunk mm -hmm. because they are 
like I, I'm, I can't I need an analogy. Maybe the people who are watching this can give me an analogy. But it was like, I don't know, like you're stirring up alphabet soup yeah. and trying to read it. Right. Well, and you're just like, well, it's, it's got letters in it. The, the thing that's leading me to further existential crisis is we're reaching the point where between Twitter bot farms, YouTube mm -hmm. generated by AI, someone who wants to push a concept mm -hmm. can make it seriously appear real because you generate what looks like a CNN screen capture about it. You mm -hmm. generate images. You set your Twitter farm saying variations of the exact same sentence over and over, and then you link to the four YouTube channels you've generated. Sure. And you can create so much buzz. And I'll periodically go down the, the rabbit hole looking at the, the Russian propaganda around the Ukrainian war and like, they, they had most recently all of this stuff about how the U.S. has all of these different things going on where, like, I live in St. Louis. The stuff they're saying is not happening. Mm -hmm. and, but if you don't live there, how do you know? And it keeps taking yeah. me back to Neil Stevenson's book, The Fall, where essentially they social media propagandized a nuclear attack on a city and everyone believed it because it was carried out so flawlessly mm. with plants in all the right places and how far so everybody believed it happening. that yeah. this nuclear attack had happened yeah um and there was and i i haven't read this but someone was mentioning maybe it's a david brin book i don't know where the artificial intelligence social media is so skilled that they'll write something that is 99% accurate and then has 1% that it's attempting yeah. to slightly push. But, and so I think how this is different, like we've always had the ability to try to influence people at scale with propaganda and so on, but this, but you can do targeted social socialization at mm -hmm. scale. So I can spin up, I can pick a target like you, and then I could spin up an unlimited amount of content to target you mm -hmm. with things that matter to you to, to keep you in a, just a complete media bubble all the time. And that yeah. literally the only way for you to escape it is to not consume any kind of media at all, which is pretty close to where I've gotten at this point. Like uh, uh, there was a, a friend of mine's son died. And, you know, I was really close with them and I heard about the, his son dying and I was, you know, expressed my condolences to them. And then one of my friends said, oh, you know, how come you weren't at the celebration of life for their son? I'm like, oh, I didn't know what was happening. On social media. It, was, it was only on Facebook. And yeah. so I like, because I'm not on Facebook, I just like, I miss all of this stuff, but I just I can't, I can't do it. I can't be on this stuff anymore. So I have at all. I have managed to train Facebook to only show me ads related to things that I am far too likely to buy, such as Kickstarters for new bar board games and camping right. supplies. Sure. So I, my Facebook feed is fairly free of propaganda because it's showing me people I follow and it's showing me Kickstarter ads for board games. Mm -hmm. Um, but everywhere else, yeah, I totally agree with you. And this is where we're starting to see even more of how Cambridge Analytics was so devastating mm -hmm. and see more and more how TikTok trends, Instagram trends are being used to socially get out of us information mm -hmm. that can be used to then future target us. Yeah. And so I think there is an enormous opportunity now for a new kind of social media. Mm -hmm. One which is where you own your content, you supply the information, you, you, the artificial intelligence will help you filter out the bad actors before they even reach you, mm -hmm. like you're gonna have to curate it, but you're gonna have to put the work in. Like you can't just show up and go like, hey guys, what are we talking about? The way you used to be able to do that and just trust that you would just be in the middle of a really fun conversation. And like 
people ask me how I am getting so much reading done. How am I getting so much, you know, gardening and cutting down trees done and hiking and, and all of this. And it's because I just, I, I have so much time on my hands because I don't spend a second on any of this stuff anymore. Okay. And you have, you have, I have a homework assignment for you because I know you are also a reader. You have mm -hmm. got to read Neil Stevenson's Fall or Dodge in Hell because okay. it, it, the entire book goes through talking about this and also video games. So I know you'll like it for other reasons. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I feel bad because I haven't been playing as many video games as I, as I know I should, but it's summertime. Like I'll, I'll switch back into video game yeah. mode as That's the, a as the, sport. yeah, exactly. It's a winter sport. Um, but yeah, like I'm probably reading three or four books a week now. Um, and partly it's kind of guilt, like it goes like, <laughs> oh, you should read the culture series. I'm like, okay. Um, so, so then I have to read the whole series. I can't just read one book. Right. I got to read all 10 and then, and before I can move on to the next recommendation, right. You know, it's be like someone saying like, you should watch one piece. I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. Like how many of those are there? 1000. Oh God. <laughs> This this is what I'm supposed to do now. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, but it's been good to read. I'm really enjoying it, and like, in fact, it, my podcasting has has taken the hit. So back to the beginning of the rant. Um, <laughs> I join our Patreon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, right. Like I think like like this is bordering on existential right now. Yeah. That yeah. that the content creators that you and not necessarily ours because we're doing fine yeah but join the patreons of the people who are not going to be able to they're going to be dragged into the morass or the paid sub stacks me. that's another way yeah um I, yeah like so i have a problem with with that with substack just because it's putting your eggs into the into the someone else's pocket like it's yeah. just a countdown until substack does something that makes them unpopular with yeah. the with with the people they're supposed to serve like look what's happening with reddit right like suddenly right. Reddit went from the this wonderful useful diverse place of of hilarity and conversation yeah. and photoshop battles and and useful valuable information to a to, to a blackout yeah and and a a place where all of this valuable infrastructure that's built on top of it is being destroyed overnight yeah and suddenly you realize um that you know this wonderful place that you and all your friends built is now just is going to be used to make a profit bunch of people rich when they do yeah. their IPO. It, it turns out i am not a good capitalist which was known already. This is not new information for anyone. I... <laughs> I, I'm a good capitalist. I like being a, I like being a capitalist, but I think you're a bad capitalist if you take advantage of the of of like the tragedy of the commons. Like if you don't yeah. How... take into account the tragedy of the commons. Then you're a bad capitalist. Have Have you seen Cory Doctorow's Inshedification essays lately? No. They're brilliant. So what he's been talking about is how you'll have a company when it first comes into existence that is like, oh, you want this feature? Yes, we'll give you this feature. Oh, you want this feature? Yes, we'll oh, develop yeah, that yeah, for yeah. you. Tell us what yeah, you yeah. want. Right. And then there's this turning point where they're like, no, we we now have all of you here. We have gathered you together. We have created something that you require for your very existence. And now we will destroy it in the name of getting money. Yeah. And yeah, go read go read his essays. I, I paraphrase yeah, terribly. I, read, I think I read one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Arjun asks, why would AI word salad connect more than PBS Spacetime or Astronomy Cast? What does it tap into? So, like, I think you you have you ever watched a documentary about a topic that you know a lot about and it's just it's infuriatingly wrong yes well imagine that but produced at an epic scale and 
that for a lot of people, they don't understand that it's wrong or why it's wrong. Right. And, and it's this scale that slides off into increasing amounts of wrongness, but it like, it you, know, you could talk to a person who loves space and they're like, look, why do you love it? Wow. Well, it's like, it's, it's like it's so big and it's like everything. I love stars and black holes and it's a dream and Star Trek. You know, we have yeah. this emotional response to curiosity and space and all this kind of stuff. And I think that something that is low quality meets the bare minimum, crosses some kind of threshold and well, fulfills some need. I don't know. It makes it hard to find what you want. Do, do you remember when Etsy went from thou shalt sell homemade things to, yeah, anyone can share, anyone Never. can sell stuff there. And no, there was no. this massive influx of cheap Chinese stuff. Right. And so it. if you were trying to find like the perfect Doctor Who TARDIS dress, you suddenly had to go through 300 pages of Chinese cheap stuff before you found that one hand made by a loving cosplayer who felt Doctor Who in their soul and created right. a thing of beauty. And if, if what you want is that high quality where you're giving to the creative and allowing them to have a career working on something they're passionate about and you pay more versus, yeah, I just need something for the, the con this weekend. It's really hard to find those things you want to support yeah. once so all of the initiation so, happens. So I think you're exactly right. It's discovery that, yeah. you know, back to the, like, why will people watch the, this AI generated verbal diarrhea over PBS space time? which is, right. you know, a PhD astrophysicist who really knows what he's talking about, right. but also provides very challenging topics in an, in an explainable and accessible way, right? Yeah. They're using the same words, but one is putting it together in this cohesive way and is funded by the people who, who watch the thing. Well, the other one, you literally, you're just spinning up, like you, you spin up a, a and like, I could do this. <sighs> Yeah. Right. I could just give chat. I could work with chat GPT to generate scripts for, and then have them read by a version of my voice or just pick one of their off the shelf mm -hmm. voices. The part that's a little more time consuming would be to actually find video footage that you would then put into it. And then some inspiring background music, but you could do it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I could probably make up an hour long AI video a day and they would be like the most buzzword friendly topics imaginable. Yeah. But, but it's just, it's nonsense and it provides no value. Well, so, so like, but, but I think a person shows up and they're like, I love Star Trek and I love Star Wars and I love this idea of black holes. And here's the a video that's going to, that's going to say all the stuff that I like the best. And it has references to Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku, who I think are really cool. And yeah. I'm going to watch this video and they're like, oh man. And they talked about black holes and they talked about wormholes and they talked about warp drives. And this was great. I love this, you know, thumbs up. And then they Socially move on to the engineered. next one. Yeah. Yeah. And they move on to the next one and, yeah. and they see that it's getting 6.5 million views from YouTube. So it must be a good video. And, and it's, and these are mega supermassive black holes. They are the cores of galaxy clusters that are siphoning in all of the value away and from everybody else. And destroying star formation in the process. Yeah, yeah. So Carolyn B is saying that BBC Click talked about different aspects of AI, talked about artists whose work was used without permission. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That, like, that's a whole separate other issue. Like yeah. there are all kinds of problematic issues about AI. And so the fact that AI is built on the value of other people is, mm -hmm. is problematic and should be sorted out. You should yeah. be able to choose whether or not your content is is incorporated into the training mm -hmm. i'm i'm perfectly fine with it like if you want to use all of my content to train your ais be my guest because hopefully we'll get better quality into it so uh anyway big problem yeah. like i think existential like i think we are going to find out youtube has to somehow figure out that these channels are bad 
even though they're making them boatloads of money and there's nothing. And it's the boatloads of money that's the problem. Yeah. And so they're, they're going to make money off of this, yeah. off of this cheap crap and, and other, and, and they're going to starve all of the Etsy, you know, TARDIS dress yeah. sewers out of the business. And they're, and they're pulling up the ladder after them. Yeah. There's All right. On that note that. of complete despair. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so watch the Kyle Hill video. Yeah. And he makes some very specific recommendations of what you can do as a person who's watching this kind of thing. And go look up. All of his recommendations. The Corey Doctorow sure. essays because they're excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And then go look up and turn off social media because yeah. And so just remember, you are you are you know the last people who will have found your way to creators who hopefully know what they're talking about and try to That's put cool. in some quality into the work that they do. And uh, and the next generation won't. They would just follow. They would just be That's swimming true. in a sea of of actually high quality <laughs> verbal diarrhea. So. All right. On that joyous note. Okay. All right. We will be we back will, uh, next week and for the then final episode Summer comes of the right. cast for this season. We will see you all, all right. next Thanks, week. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye.